Thank you very much, Naomi. Thank you for that reflection. Um, some challenging facts, uh, information that we need to take on board and think about. Um, I drove into the city today. I live in the western side of the city. How many of you live on the western side of the city? Let me see. Yeah. Uh, I came in from Caroline Springs. Um, how many of you live in the city, in the CBD? We won't be too definitive of how, how many? One, two, three, four, right, five, good. Um, this is valuable for me to think about too as we do our workshop today. How many of you come from eastern suburbs or southeastern suburbs? Okay, north, north of the city, right. Um, anywhere else? Adelaide. <laughs> right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll let you into Melbourne today. Good. Right. Yeah, good. Um, you'll probably find the water here is um, sweeter than Adelaide. <laughs> yes. Uh, but as we drove into the city, you could see the envelope of smog around the CBD today. It was pretty heavy, wasn't it? Did you notice it? Uh, you may not have seen it if you came in on a train. How many, did you, how many came on trains? Yes. How many drove? Okay. Yes. Buses. I walked. Yeah, good. Okay. From the southeast suburbs? Western. Western. Good. Right. Um, yeah, you could see this very, very heavy smog settled around the inner city today. Basically from the Maribyrnong River across to the Yarra River on the other side. Um, but the city was in very heavy smog. And that's part of the reflection to think about um, our environment and our city and our country. Um, so thank you very much, Naomi, for drawing our attention to these important insights. Uh, I spend quite a bit of time in other countries. Uh, the um, the health challenge today is um, a lifestyle disease. Um, the major lifestyle disease is diabetes. And already um, more than half of the world's population is um, figured to be diabetic. And that basically comes from eating white rice, um, processed meat, uh, sausages, and sugary drinks. That's basically what it's coming from. It's coming from the proliferation of the Western diet instead of fruits, nuts, grains, vegetables, especially the, the variety of coloured fruits and vegetables that we have which can actually reduce and eradicate diabetes, even if you contracted diabetes, which is a lifestyle disease. But already we're seeing whole nations, their longevity is reducing. So for example, in Fiji, um, longevity or age expect expectancy is down to 57 years. That's quite a considerable drop in recent times. In the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, it's dropping down to 55, 56 years of age because of the prevalence of diabetes. And that's all related to what Naomi is talking about today. Uh, so we're seeing enormous impact upon our world, our society, our city. Um, today our workshop is about if you can eat, you can make disciples multiplying disciples, multiplying churches, and we're in particular focusing upon our context of the CBD of Melbourne. That's why I wanted to get some idea of where you're actually from, um, where you live, uh, because that will assist me and assist us as we discuss together the focus of Melbourne City Church and your main mission of the CBD. So although some of us live outside the CBD and we come into the city, um, your primarily, primary mission 
as a church is to the inner city, the central business district and the uh, multitudes of people who live in this part of the city. And so we're going to focus our attention on how to make disciples, how to share faith in a way that's not scary, in a way that can actually engage with people in a meaningful and vigorous way uh, in our context. And I think the reflection that we've had our attention drawn to today heightens our awareness of the importance and the significance of engaging people with the gospel. Of course, we are relating to our city and our country and our world as responsible citizens, but we're not simply citizens of a country where we're voting today, but we're also citizens of the kingdom of God. And we have the privilege, not only the responsibility, but the privilege and the opportunity of engaging with people so that they can know God and not only live for now, but live for eternity. We don't know how long the now is going to last. We have no idea at all. I'm not one of those who are going to say to you, you know, by this time next year, Jesus could come, so you better sort things out now. I'm not going to be doing that. Um, Seventh-day Adventists have been saying that for over 150 years and Jesus hasn't yet come. So nothing is gained too much by emphasising, hey, it could happen in the next 12 months. It could happen in the next two years. In actual fact, I believe from scripture that Jesus could come before we finish our worship service today. Now you might say, hang on, aren't there quite a few things to happen before that happens? Well, the reality is that we live in a little bubble here in Australia and we're not totally aware of the times of trouble and the conflicts and all of the issues that are taking place around us. Mid this last week, I've just returned from the Middle East. I was leading a study program through Jordan and Israel over the last number of weeks. And of course, even traveling in the Middle East, you're living in a bubble because although I sit in the evenings and look at the media and during the daytime, I check on the media on my phone um, when I'm traveling through Jordan and Israel. Uh, what is taking place on the border of Gaza with Israel is not reality for people living in Jerusalem or living in Galilee. It's not reality for people in the Middle East. It's just a little portion. So wherever you are, you tend to live in a bubble. Um, we're certainly in a bubble of uh, an ideal environment here in Australia. And so we can lose track of actually what is taking place around us. Um, I'm of the opinion when I read scripture that Jesus could come as soon as this morning. But it's not for me to even focus on that. Jesus said, that's not what you give your attention to. The time of the coming of Jesus is in the Father's hands and the Father's authority. It's nothing to do with us. It's not for us to spend any time on at all. Jesus made that very clear. In Matthew chapter 24, in Acts chapter 1, he said, that's not the theme of your focus. You're not to be heaven gazers or star gazers trying to work out a time. Because the time is nothing to do with us. Jesus said, I've given you your job. And your job is to be full of the Holy Spirit and to be witnesses for me. And speaking to his disciples just before he ascended to heaven, he said, you're to witness for me in Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria. Well, Jerusalem was OK for them because they were background Jewish believers who had become believers in Jesus. So Jerusalem sounded OK, but Judea, yes, that's getting away from the holy city. But Samaria... That's where the hated half-bred Samaritans lived. They were dirty people. Uh, we're going to take the gospel to them and be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That would have been almost incomprehensible to the followers of Jesus at that time as Jesus spoke to him just before his ascension to heaven. But that's what Jesus said. He said, it's not for you to think about the times or the days when I will come. That's in the Father's hands alone. Your job is to receive the Holy Spirit 
And when you have been empowered by the Holy Spirit, then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, of course, Jesus' life was about sharing uh, discipleship and sharing the good news of the kingdom. His life was about making disciples. He made disciples. He taught those disciples. He equipped those disciples to make other disciples so that disciples multiplied. And then he died for all of his disciples. He rose for his disciples. And he said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So the task that we have as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus, the task that we have is the privilege of doing what he would do if he was here today. The task that we have is engaging with people and leading them to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, in the little book, If You Can Eat, You Can Make Disciples, I've, I've endeavoured to um, demystify the whole issue of evangelism and disciple making. Because we've made witnessing so complicated that really only the professional can do it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, just edging into the 50th year of my ministry. I'm not, not really that old, but um, my hair betrays my age and, and the fact that I have uh, boys who are, the oldest son is almost 47 and the next one's almost 45. That kind of tells people, hey, you must be getting a bit old now. And uh, the fact that I'm edging into the 50th year of my ministry also indicates that I might be getting on in years just a little bit, a little bit older than some of you. But um, the, the, the fact is that over these years of ministry, much of my ministry has been a professional type of evangelism um, that not everybody can do. Um, it takes enormous energy, um, skill, determination, focus, uh, to do evangelism the way it's been modelled and developed by Christian faith over the years. And the form of evangelism that we've tended to do in Australia uh, and around the world has been a very professional type of evangelism where you have a single person standing on a stage with a lot of multimedia um, to present uh, the gospel and then persuade people to uh, follow the particular tribe or understanding that we have of Christian faith. Um, and the, the actual fact is the majority would say, that's not for me, I can't possibly do that. I don't have the skills, I don't have the time to do that. Well, when I go back to look at the methods of Jesus, I find the methods of Jesus were very simple. Um, no cost. Uh, anybody could do it. Um, it was reproducible. In fact, it's really interesting. Common feature in Jesus' ministry was as soon as he made a disciple, he said, okay, you go and do it. So we find Jesus at the Jordan River. He was baptized. He was baptized by the Holy Spirit. He went into the wilderness. He came back 40 days later. John the Baptist introduced him to the crowd. Look, the Lamb of God, the Son of God. The next day again, look, the Lamb of God. And two of John the Baptist's followers walked after Jesus and said, uh, where are you staying? And he said, come and see. And so they spent the day with Jesus and at the end of that day, those two went to others, Andrew to his brother Peter, Philip to his friend Nathaniel, and said, we found the Messiah. And they said, How, how's that possible? Uh, they said, come and see. And so they immediately started with the invitations of Jesus, which were very simple. Come, come and see, come and experience who he is. And the next day, Jesus met these four, and some scholars think maybe five of them, and, uh, and said, follow me. There was the second invitation. Come and see, follow me. As you go through the story of Jesus, 
um, Jesus was always using those simple principles. So the woman at the well, Samaritan woman, um, Jesus meets her. Probably 40, 45 minutes later, she declares, hey, if you are really the one you describe, give me the water, I will drink this, I want to follow you so that I will never thirst. And Jesus immediately says to her, okay, you go and you call your husband. So he's saying, I want you involved. You've decided to be a follower of me. You immediately go and do the same. And every time a person became a follower of Jesus in the stories of Jesus, he immediately put them into action in making other disciples. So it was something that it was simple, uh, easy to do. Anyone could do it. It was reproducible. It cost nothing. Uh, and when we look at Jesus' training of his disciples, and this little book goes through Jesus' training in Luke chapter 10, where he was actually training a bunch of 72 other disciples. So he's training them. This is how you do it. This is how you connect to people. And, and he made it very simple. He said, when you're going to connect to people, number one, you eat their food. That's the first thing you do. Now, before I left home this morning, my wife was reading, me, reading to me uh, a little article about culture. And uh, while I was busy doing some other things, she was just commenting on this article that she'd found about culture and how culture is food. Culture is food. Culture is language. Would you agree? That's where it, that is where it centers. In every culture in the world, centers around food, centers around language right and uh, yesterday the day started having breakfast with a businessman at quarter to seven we had a prayer breakfast with him my wife and myself then we met with some other friends over in Ivanhoe then we ducked back across the city to where we live and we got a phone call from some Buddhist neighbors some Buddhist friends uh, do you have a few moments could you pop in and have some food well, they didn't actually say food. They said, let's go for a walk. But with the moment we got there, they're putting food in front of us. Didn't say, have you eaten? Because you see, in Asian cultures, you don't ask, have you eaten? You just give food and you expect people to eat. Because food is culture and culture is food. And so we're kind of hedging around not trying to eat too much because we've already had three meals and the day hasn't finished and then I've got another appointment at four o'clock with somebody else and I know there's going to be some more food there. And, and so the day is going on and it's food, food, food. Every culture has food. And Jesus said, when you're connecting, you start with food. But he didn't say cook up food yourself. He said, you connect, you eat their food. You eat their food. And then the second thing you do is you heal them. And the third thing you do is introduce the kingdom of God to them. Now, if you're going to move to step number two, which is heal people, which means encourage, support, bless, help overcome all kinds of challenges, um, evil, uh, ill health it's a whole range of stuff healing it's not just uh, healing a sickness a physical sickness it could be an emotional sickness a, um, a um, mental health issue addressing all of those if you're going to get to there then eating has to be more than just eating Jesus said eat their food and I would suggest it's eat their food and listen eat their food and listen to their story so as you eat a little with a person, you're listening to their story. And then when you've heard their story, now you're ready to bring some encouragement, some healing, some counsel, some advice even, some practical guidance, some support. That's all healing. And prayer, that's healing. Because we're whole people. We're not just uh, physical people or spiritual people. We're whole people. So it all comes together. So Jesus said, first point of connecting is eat their food. Second point is heal them. Eat, listen to their stories, heal them, share a little of your story, introduce the kingdom of God is near, God's story. We'll talk more about this as we go. But as we introduce God's story, we come to the place where we're going to be sharing the word of God with people. 
Because when you think about making disciples and leading people into relationship with Jesus, you will find that um, people will only grow in their relationship with God if the word of God fills their experience and fills their lives. Um, so I thought to start with, we'd actually uh, spend a little bit of time in our groups and we'll read a scripture together. We've gone straight into Luke chapter 10, but we read Luke chapter 10 when we were together in Marks. And so I thought we, we need to look at another scripture that illustrates the same kinds of points. Only this is perhaps a little more targeted towards the city environment that we find ourselves here in, in um, Melbourne City Church and the CBD that we're part of. So we're turning to Acts chapter 19 and uh, we'll read this story, then I'll give a little bit of background and then we'll unpack some really key ideas here. Acts chapter 19 and we're going to read from verses 1 to 10. Acts 19 verses 1 to 10. I'll just give you some background if you're not familiar with the book of Acts. Um, the book of Acts, uh, first of all, Jesus is part of the story and then Jesus ascends to heaven with his commission saying to his disciples, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. Now this was really confronting. So the first seven chapters of Acts are about witnessing in Jerusalem. The disciples were very comfortable with that, sharing faith in Jerusalem. That's amongst people who sing the same songs, pray the same prayers, read the same scriptures, eat the same food. These are Jewish people, right? Then there's a transition that comes with the persecution, uh, in fact, the martyrdom, the killing of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And, and the followers of Jesus are scattered from Jerusalem. And so chapter 8, you have them reaching out into Judea and Samaria. Horror of horrors. They're going into Samaria. And they're sharing the gospel. And Samaritans became believers in Jesus as well. So now you have Jews who are believers and Samaritans who are believers. And then in Acts chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, we have the transition stories of the book of Acts, which I discussed a little bit when I was here in March. First of all, Samaritans becoming believers, then Ethiopians becoming believers, then their arch enemy Saul becoming a believer, and then the gospel going to Cornelius, who was an Italian, a foreigner from the heart of the Roman Empire, a pagan, and he becomes a believer in Jesus. And the Jewish followers of Jesus were being confronted at each step. It's kind of like a hammer blow. Uh, yes, Samaritans. Yes, Ethiopians. Yes, even your arch enemy. Yes, even pagans will become believers in Jesus. You got, you got the idea? And then you come through to chapter 11. Now the gospel is going to the ends of the earth. Antioch, up there in um, Turkey today, Syrian Antioch, becomes the base now of the missionary movements of the second part of the book of Acts. And the gospel moves out to Cyprus and up into central Turkey, second missionary movement. Uh, the gospel reaches across into Macedonia, northern Greece today, and then into southern Greece. Now we have the third missionary movement, Acts chapter 19. And Paul is is preparing to take the gospel into what was called the Roman province of Asia or the city, this big city of Ephesus. It was a big city at that time, 250, 300,000 people, a banking center, commercial center, center of one of the wonders of the ancient world, the great temple of Artemis or Diana of Ephesus. So that's what we're reading about when we come to Acts chapter 19 verses 1 to 10. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read these verses once. Then one person at your table will read this story to the others at the table. And then another person at your table, it's going to be a struggle here. You may need to move over there. Another person at the table is going to tell the story in your own words to the others. Okay, so here is a little piece of advice. If you don't want to be the one who tells the story, you jump in and read it straight away. So you, and then it's... Someone else has to tell the story, okay? Acts 19, page, what page? 893? Okay. While Apollos was in Corinth, that's out from Athens, 
Paul traveled through the interior regions, that's through central Turkey, until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Now that was John the Baptist. Because you see, before Jesus came, John the Baptist was getting people ready for the coming of Jesus. And he was baptizing people in a baptism of repentance. It really surprises some of the study groups that I take to the Middle East to find out that the the Jewish people were baptizing many people long before John the Baptist or Jesus came along. They had baptisms every day in a mikvah or a uh, ceremonial ritual pool. They had these baptisms. They had these mikvayot, that's the plural for mikvah, in their, in their homes. And, uh, and they had ritual baptism where they immersed themselves right beneath the water in preparation for their prayers, in preparation to go to the temple or the synagogue and that type of thing. And before Jesus came the first time, um, John the Baptist was down at the River Jordan in the desert and he's saying, repent of your sins. The Messiah is coming. It's time to be ready for him. And as a sign of their repentance of sin, they were baptized. This was not Christian baptism. It's not Christian baptism. They were not baptized in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. It was repentance to get ready for the Messiah. So John come, uh, Paul comes to Ephesus and finds a bunch of these men and they are disciples, They've, they are believers in God, uh, but he sees something's not, something is lacking in their experience. And so he asks them, what baptism did you receive and, and did you receive the Holy Spirit? They haven't even heard about the Holy Spirit. What baptism? John's baptism. John's baptism, John, John's baptism called for repentance, verse 4. Repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one coming later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues or other languages and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So now these people were baptized by the Holy Spirit. And one evidence, not the evidence, but one evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in other languages. It's not the evidence, but it is an evidence, right? And there's about 12 fellows. Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way, the way of Jesus. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him, no doubt including these 12 men who had been baptised into Jesus and baptised by the Holy Spirit. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Now Tyrannus, that's an interesting one because this is a lecture hall or a school belonging to a fellow called Tyrannus. And you know what Tyrannus means? It simply means the tyrant teacher. I'm not sure whether his pupils call him the tyrant teacher and it got out around the city or whether the parents told him, call him the tyrant teacher. A tyrant teacher and it got around the city but anyhow he's called the tyrant teacher and uh, some earlier documents indicate that during the siesta time when the school, school classrooms and lecture th halls were not used between 11 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the afternoon 11 o'clock just before noon and 4 o'clock in the afternoon everybody in those places has siesta it's a great idea who comes from a country where they have siesta anyone yeah it's an excellent idea. I mean, you have to start the day earlier and you have to go much later at night. But during the day, uh, you just chill, you know, drink coffee, uh, have a sleep. Um, everything, everything closes down. All the shops close down. Everything closes during siesta. So the school shuts, siesta time. Paul says, ideal time. Um, so he 
he probably rents the lecture hall of Tyrannus or maybe Tyrannus had become a believer in Jesus and makes this lecture hall available. And so um, Paul uses this for daily discussions. And this goes on for how long? Verse 10. Two years. So that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Now this is such an interesting story, but I'm not going to talk more about it now. One person at your table, read the story from verses 1 to 10. Another person in about two minutes, give a summary in your own words of this story. Way you go. One person has read, another person told the story, and immediately, as I watched, you went into a broader discussion. Is that right? So most of you were not just retelling the story you're actually discussing uh, raising ideas and possibilities as to what this story is about etc so um, we need to find ways to generate spiritual discussions amongst our friends in the same way as you've enjoyed this kind of discussion um, and the whole concept of if you can eat you can make disciples is built on a very simple reproducible model that we call discovery bible reading um, and what we're trying to do is get back into the method of jesus now you'll notice in this story that paul comes to ephesus uh, he he modeled himself on the life of jesus and when he wrote the letter to the ephesians later from a prison in rome and wrote the letter to the Colossians and to Philemon who lived out in the satellite areas of the Roman province of Asia not in Ephesus but in the churches that were planted from Paul's work in Ephesus um, he said I encourage you to follow the example of Jesus to emulate Jesus and clearly Paul in everything he did set about to emulate and followed follow the method of Jesus in life, lifestyle, um, and in disciple making. So I've read some authors and even some of my friends who have written about this say that when the apostles started their ministry of sharing faith, they, they, they didn't know what to do. They, they kind of had to grope around as to what they would actually do. I say, no, Jesus gave his example, his teaching, and his commission for disciple making and so they had the example of Jesus the method of Jesus the model of Jesus and when you look at the book of Acts you find Paul with the other apostles before him and around him following the methods of Jesus it's interesting in this particular story just as Jesus chose 12 at one particular stage so Paul is choosing 12 men you see that so there's some parallels there and you'll find a lot more parallels as you read this story through to the end of chapter 20. A lot more parallels here between Paul and, and Jesus. He was modelling himself on the life of Jesus. But he, he starts, as soon as he's got these about 12, he goes into the synagogue and he discusses the kingdom of God there. Then he takes people, he's obviously equipping and training these people and he takes them to the lecture hall or the schoolroom of Tyrannus, and they're with him there for two years, but obviously not just them. And they're obviously not just sitting there for two years at classroom desks, because after two years, the whole Jewish and Greek population of the Roman province of Asia had heard the word of the Lord. Now that verse, verse 10, is quite a, an astounding verse. Two years, and Paul actually doesn't move from Ephesus, but the whole population of Asia has heard the word of the Lord. Now, it's not Asia as we know it. Asia, of course, goes across to the Bosporus, to Istanbul. Istanbul is a European city and an Asian city. Some of you have probably been there. Fascinating city. Bridges the Bosporus, so it's in Europe and in Asia. The Roman province of Asia was a vast area. Uh, much, much bigger in territory than Victoria, probably about the size of Victoria and half of New South Wales. 
And the whole province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. All the Jews and all the Greeks in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord from Paul having discussions daily during siesta time in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And I'm saying to myself, what is actually going on here? He's got the 12, they're obviously going out. And then when you read the letters to the Ephesians and the letters to, and to the Colossians and to Philemon, you find that Paul names a bunch of people, men and women, who were going out and visiting those different areas and making disciples in places that they came from. So probably some of those people came into Ephesus to worship at the great temple of Diana, Artemis of Ephesus. And they met Paul and they were invited to the lecture hall. And they learned about Jesus. They'd come to worship Artemis. But when they got home, their families are saying, what was Artemis like? What was that great temple like? Well, we didn't actually get there. We got stuck in a little um, school hall belonging to a tyrant teacher. And we learned about Jesus. What are you talking about? And as you read into chapter 20, you see that the trade of all the silver merchants in Ephesus was dropping. So actually impacting the city and, and the silver merchants guild, the union, they were crying out and saying, we're losing our profits because this Paul and all of his followers are sharing the gospel all across the world. That's how they saw it. And the number of idols and statues and icons that we're making uh, is dropping so fast that we're losing business. And, and maybe even the, the reputation of Diana of Ephesus will be tarnished as a result of this preaching about this person, Jesus. Now, it clearly wasn't Paul who was doing all of this. Started with the twelve. Then others who were coming in and going out, Erastus and Epaphras and a whole lot of others are mentioned, uh, including Nympha, a lady, and different ladies as well as men. And they were sharing their faith and new communities of faith were multiplying. I, I tried to find out the population of that area at that particular time. Uh, the best I can come up with is somewhere between one and one and a half million people across the Roman province of Asia. And all the Jews and all the Greeks in Asia had heard the story of Jesus because there was a little group meeting in this room in the CBD of Melbourne, meeting for two years, and the whole population of Victoria heard the story of Jesus. Now that's, that's challenging, isn't it? Right? So what's going on? To start with, the, the methods of Paul were simple, reproducible. Anybody could do it at no cost. And that's basic. So we've got to come back and we've got to ask, how can we share faith in ways that are simple and easy and, and it's easily reproducible? Um, there's some important statements that challenge us to return to the first century method of Jesus. This is a statement that I share with um, Christian leaders of all different churches, whether I'm talking to Baptist leaders, Church of Christ leaders, uh, Anglican leaders, Adventist leaders. This is a great insight. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Saviour mingled with people as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence. Then he said to them, follow me. And if we... I think I've... Sorry. Now I've really messed it up, haven't I? Sorry about that, James. Can you get me back on the right one? I turned the screen off and then I turned it on and then I turned it off again and here we are. Upon all who believe, God has placed a burden of raising up churches. This was the concept that Paul had. Here is another really important insight. This is an interesting statement. We must do more than we have done to reach the people of our cities. We're not to erect large buildings in the cities. 
But over and over again, the light has been given to me that we should establish in all our cities small plants which shall be centres of influence. This was a concept that Paul was working with. Um, establishing a centre of influence, a hub of influence in Ephesus, and then multiplying out into other areas and engaging with neighbours and with, with friends. Let's stop on this one. Um, these, these folk here represent, and they are some of our neighbours, uh, good friends, close friends. We have neighbours who are of no faith, neighbours who are Muslim, such as this family, uh, neighbours who are Buddhists, um, Hindus, uh, Sikhs, uh, Catholics, nominal Catholics, um, nominal Protestants. That's our community, right? Um, so let's bring it down to our communities. How do we engage with friends? Jesus said, step number one, eat. Eat their food. So um, you live in Narrawarren or you live in Preston or you live in Footscray or you live in the CBD. Who are the people that you connect to? Uh, where, what is the circle of your friendship? Where do you engage in life? Um, who do you have coffee with? How many of you had a meal, morning tea, lunch, you ate your sandwiches or you had a coffee with somebody yesterday? Let me see. Who had a coffee or a meal or uh, a sandwich, or a piece of bread, or some food, and there was somebody else sitting at the table where, with you when you ate or had a coffee yesterday. Right. Who was totally on their own yesterday for all of their morning teas, afternoon teas, meals? Let me see. Yes, some of you were on your own. Yes, okay, that's okay. What about during this week? How many have had at least one meal time or a coffee or a sandwich, morning tea, afternoon tea, breakfast, lunch or dinner? Who has actually been with somebody else at a table during this week? Let me see the hands. Right. And let me see the hands of those who ate totally on their own this week. Right. Okay. Okay. Pretty well everybody engaged with somebody else. Um, how many of you shared a meal or coffee or a sandwich, morning tea, afternoon tea, breakfast, lunch or dinner with a person who is not a Christian? Let me see. Okay. Um, you, are, you are on the first step of evangelism. When you've had a meal or a coffee or a sandwich with someone who is not a believer, you are on the first step that Jesus outlined as the steps of connecting to sharing the story of Jesus, to sharing the good news of salvation. Because you're eating with somebody. How many of you are eating someone else's food that they paid for? They said, my shout for the coffee. Let me see. Okay, quite a few of you. Um, actually ate somebody else's food or drank someone else's drink. Now, let me say, some of you may um, have a, a strong aversion towards coffee. Some of you may not drink coffee. That's okay. But in the Australian context, when we say coffee, we don't even mean coffee. Is that true? You say to a friend, let's have a coffee together. And then you meet at a cafe and you say, what are you going to have? I thought we were going to have a coffee. You don't say to each other, let's go and have a drink of water together. Right? The, the language we use, the connecting language of our social conduct is let's have a coffee. Is that true? Okay, so, so you're with somebody. That person is a friend. That person may be a fellow believer with you. That person may not be. That person may be of a world religion that person may be of no faith at all so how do you connect with that person in a way that is 
fun, non-threatening, uh, is simple, so that you may have the opportunity, if the door of opportunity opens, you may have the opportunity of sharing faith. Now, I want you to notice how I've qualified that. I haven't said that you are going to share faith. I haven't said that you are going to preach at the person. Uh, I haven't said you're going to tell the person the truth regardless of whether they want to hear it. I've said, if the door of opportunity opens, the key is to listen. Instead of talk about yourself, and some of you are better listeners than others, some of us tend to talk more about ourselves, but uh, the key is to listen. How are things going? What's happening? You said that your relationship was pretty stormy at the moment. You said that you're struggling with examinations at the moment. You said that you're struggling with some interviews that you're doing. You said that you're out of work, you've got to find another job, you're in the midst of interviews. I was with someone yesterday, already this week has put in five applications, has done four interviews for a new job. A lot of financial pressure, right? So how are things going? You ask, what's happening? And you listen. Um, you ask the question, not prying, but as a friend, you ask a question so, so that you're genuinely listening. You are not on a program of converting that person. You're on a program of listening. So it's, it's not a, it's not a uh, formula that you have to follow. It's just that you're a friend listening. right? And as the person talks, the opportunity comes for some healing some encouragement, some support, some advice. And so yesterday as we spent time with friends, we found ourselves discussing with them um, issues of superannuation. And as we find many times in our society, th the wife has about six um, different superannuation companies that she has um, some products with. And so she's paying fees here and there, and she just got a letter uh, update, to update some stuff. And, and so she's got some through a company that she worked there and some through a company that she worked there. And so she's paying multiple fees uh, and her, her superannuation is going nowhere. They're not very, not very old, uh, but I mean in their mid-30s or something like that. But it's time to sort some of that out now. Would you agree? And so the encouragement that we gave them was simply, hey, if you go online, you can find ASIC and you can get some details there and you can find super, superannuation that you'd forgotten about. And you can, so is that healing? I say it's healing because this is really a broken area of their lives. They were quite distressed about this. And so we could talk about it. Uh, we could encourage them. We could give them some ideas. We could say, and, and when we visit again, we can discuss it some more and see if you've been able to resolve that, that issue. So Jesus says, you connect, eat. And we've been eating. We were listening. And then bring some healing. And that can be in the practical areas of life, um, cover just about any areas, area of life. And keep in the back of your mind a simple acronym that we've often used in the past, new start. N is for good nutrition, E is for exercise, W is for water, S is for sunlight, T is for temperance and balance, A is for fresh air, R is for rest, T is for trust in God. That kind of covers a whole uh, gamut of possibilities of how to engage and bring some encouragement and healing to people. And then because this particular couple that we were with um, yesterday uh, we've had the opportunity, they're, they're Buddhists, we've had the opportunity of supporting them and encouraging them and praying with them. And so we say, and we can pray with you. Now, if you're with friends and you've never prayed with those friends before, as you talk about various issues of life for them and you're listening to them, you can also introduce, I don't know how you feel about it, but we can pray for you. I can pray for you now. And if you're going to pray for somebody, 
you use very simple language, as I did with one couple yesterday. Very simple language. God, we thank you that you're interested in our lives and we're asking that you'll please help as this planning is done or whatever you're talking about. Thank you. That's it. There's no need for religious prayers. You're talking to God as in a conversation with a friend. So the simple steps that Jesus gave were eat. All of you have been, just about all of you have been eating with somebody uh, during the past week. Now you think about how could I intentionally listen so as to learn more about that friend, to engage more, to support, to encourage, bring some healing. And then is it an appropriate time to pray? Now, it often seems that it's never an appropriate time to pray. You may not even use the word prayer. You know, I don't know how you feel about this, but I believe in God. And I can also ask God to help you and to guide you and to lead your life and to bless you. If you use the word bless, people will probably ask you, what do you mean by that? What do you mean when you say bless? Because we use language within the Christian circles that most of our friends have never heard. Uh, but it's okay. You can clarify what you mean by the term bless. And, uh, and you know, um, my wife, Judy and I, or I, um, believe um, in God. And so he's, and we believe that he's interested in you. I'm not sure how you feel about this idea of God, but many people will respond and say, oh, we believe in God. We just don't talk about it too much. Or, yeah, I believe in Allah. Or, yeah, I pray at the shrine of, uh, that we have in our home. Um, and that shrine may be a myriad of gods that people have. And uh, you can simply say, well, I pray to the living creator God and we can talk with him about guiding your lives and caring for you as well. And the bridge then is into sharing the story of Jesus. The kingdom of God is near you. And that's where the opportunity comes to say, would you like to perhaps read a little book to learn more about this person, Jesus? Just a little book from about 2,000 years old, 2,000 years ago. It's, it's only 20 pages, uh, a little tiny book, and it kind of introduces this story. Um, it's a really old little book. but And the little gospel of Mark, the South Pacific Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is working with Kurong and other publishers to make available as a single gospel. But you can go to Kurong already. And you can get the little gospel of Mark, which is only 20 pages long, for about $1.50 that you could give to a friend or you could suggest to your friend that they download uh, an app, a Bible app, so they could read this on their phones. And that makes it a lot easier for people to read as they travel on the train or the public transport, get themselves to work in the office. Doesn't look as if they're reading a Bible. They can just read on their phones and they can be a little bit more private for people. Uh, but you encourage people to read the Gospel of Mark so that you're actually helping them to fill their lives with the story of Jesus. Because I don't know about you, but the majority of my friends know nothing about Jesus. Nothing at all. They don't know when he was born, when he lived. They don't know the stories about his life. So how can they become followers of Jesus if they know nothing about him? So let's dive into Mark chapter 1. And I'm going to outline the concept of Discovery Bible Reading. Mark chapter 1. That is on page, have you got the page? Mark chapter 1, page 801. And I would suggest that we read just the first story. And in your... Uh, in the Bible that you have in front of you, that will be verses 1 to 8. Is that right? So you've got a heading, and it just goes verses 1 to 8. John the Baptist prepares the way. Okay, let's read. One person at the table read, another one read, and then one person tell the story. If you want to leave it to another one to tell the story, start reading straight away. 
Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 8. First story. Okay, you've read it once, twice, told the story. Grab this bookmark from the table. Um, simple, effective reading plan, whatever your knowledge or experience of Jesus. Friends meet to read stories of Jesus. The Gospel of Mark is a great place to start. Simple, um, it's just not complex. Only 20 pages. It gives people a taster. One person prays this prayer, Dear God, please guide us, thank you. And then start at the beginning, reading one story at a time. Read each story through twice, that's what you've done. Then retell the story in your own words. And that cultivates a discussion. You might be doing that with a neighbour. You might be doing it with a work colleague at morning tea, 15 minutes, 10 minutes. You might do it at lunchtime uh, with a colleague, fellow student or whatever. And um, so read the story once, read it twice. Just take one story at a time. Begin at the beginning of the book. Don't jump all around the place, right? So you just start at the beginning and you read the stories. And then we find these are five good questions that you could use. Um, what is new in the story so far? What surprises you? What don't you understand? What will you obey or apply? What will you share with someone this week? And um, you could, in this discussion with a neighbour, with a colleague, with a friend, with a family member, um, it's not what are you going to do, it's what do we do? Right, So you're part of the discussion. In fact, you might get your colleague or friend or family member to ask the questions. So they're asking you the questions. And you're engaging with the questions just as much as they are. It's not a situation where you become the teacher. It's a situation where together you explore the, the story and you start coming to know who this person Jesus is. And then plan to meet again. So why don't you try those questions at your table? Was there something new here that you hadn't seen before or you were reminded of? You might have read this story many times. Was there something that surprised you, something that you didn't understand? You, you try that in your group for a few moments. Something new? Something that surprised? Okay. We're just, we're just starting with some friends into the story of Jesus. And you read the sto first story and you explore it together. Um, because you've gone from eating, listening, healing, encouraging. Um, and that healing can also involve your testimony. I believe in God and I could also pray for you. I believe that God is alive uh, and I could pray for you. How do you feel about that? Every now and again you'll find somebody says, oh, I'm not into that. Um, but it's not very often. Uh, most people have a private view of God. There will be some people who react quite strongly, but most don't. They say, well, I'm not into that. Um, well, the God I believe in is also interested in you, even if you're not into that. So I can still talk with him about you. God, please help this person, guide this person through this tough situation right now. Thank you. Um, see, that's what prayer is. It's just talking to God like that. Okay, it didn't hurt me. Um, and so you're able to just simply, without threatening a person, open up possibilities. If a person closes the door, you're not going to press them. You're not going to hammer them. You're not going to say, well, this is my opportunity. I told them everything. Um, that is a scary way to go, both for the person that you're talking to as well as for yourself. But if you can encourage people to look at the story of Jesus and then use a simple process like Discovery Bible Reading to actually read some stories and leave it for them too. Do you have a friend? Do you have a family member? Do you have a colleague at the office that you could do this with, um, that you would enjoy doing with this with? And you give them, that person, a number of bookmarks or uh, just write down the the questions and text them to them so they know the questions and outline the idea, uh, then people start actually learning about Jesus. It's interesting reading this story in Acts chapter 19 uh, through the witness of the 12, uh, through discussions in the synagogue, through discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, 
um, we read as you continue into the story of Paul's miracles that the whole region was filled with the word of God and the word of God grew and multiplied throughout the region. Uh, in other words, the story of Jesus was multiplying uh, throughout the region. Neil Cole was in Australia recently, recently and he said, I think one reason why people are not deciding to follow Jesus in Australia at the present time is because the story of Jesus is not being told. Christians are not telling the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus is not being read. And so people can't decide to follow Jesus if they know nothing about him. Uh, whereas when we read the New Testament stories of the witness of the early apostles, they were filling cities, filling regions with this story. And the story was changing people's lives. So what I'm trying to do today is give you a simple approach that we've found our neighbours are open to, whether Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu or Sikh uh, or no faith. Someone said, yeah, um, we wouldn't mind reading that story and we wouldn't mind going through this journey of discovery uh, with you to know a little bit about this story of, of Jesus. And then you let the story of Jesus um, influence people's lives. You don't have to feel that you've got to manipulate. You're watching for the activity of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So it's simple, it's easy, it's easily reproduced and it costs nothing. In fact, you're saving money because you're eating their food. Um, so it's a, it's a great engagement with people. Now, as people continue on this journey, sometimes they'll disagree with what they find in the scripture or they disagree with the story of Jesus or they'll disagree with your comment. You might just share a comment as to how you see things. People might disagree be relaxed you don't have to defend yourself you don't have to defend God what if they ask a question that you don't have an answer to it's okay you just say I don't know or you say let's keep reading um, you don't have to have all the answers because you're on a journey together and that's one of the scariest things about a professional approach to evangelism you've got to have the answers if you haven't got the answers well you don't even start Whereas in this journey, just simply say, I don't know. Let's keep reading. Right? You learn some pretty interesting things even in this story. How many of you are into eating grasshoppers? Is that a major part of your diet? Uh, probably not. But if you're in certain parts of the world, yes, they eat a lot of grasshoppers. Um, but in other parts of the world, grasshoppers are not really part of the menu. Um, what about this fellow, John the Baptist? He, he's dressed in camel hair. He eats wild honey. He eats grasshoppers. Um, some people say, this locust, could that be the carob bean? Well, it could be because the carob bean is also spoken of as locusts. Uh, but carob beans grow up in the hills in southwestern Judea. But carob trees do not grow in the desert of the Jordan Valley. So it's unlikely that he was eating carobs. It's more likely that he was eating grasshoppers. Um, why are so many people coming to this particular spot to listen to John the Baptist? Well, you don't have to have the answers, but as you continue reading, you'll find this is where the Israelites crossed over the Jordan to Jericho. This is where Elijah and Elisha went back across the Jordan and Elisha ascended to heaven. This is where Elisha came back and set up the school of the prophets just on the, on the western side of the Jordan River. So there's a lot of history at this particular spot. It's probably even where Naaman came and dipped into the water, right, at this particular spot. So John arrives, he looks like, he sounds like, he's dressed like, he smells like an Old Testament prophet. Everything about him is Old Testament prophet. And he has got a special message. Be ready for the Messiah who's about to come. So get into this story. And I've found that as friends and colleagues start reading, and perhaps they do some of this on their own in their home or their private time, and then you come back and you say, where are you up to now? Oh, I'm actually up to Mark chapter 4. What are you learning about Jesus? You don't have to manipulate and control the whole journey you let the person read at their own pace 
You come back, where are you up to now? I'm at Mark chapter 10 or this big number 10. They may not know the idea of chapters and verses. Uh, so what are you learning about Jesus? And on this particular brochure, this little brochure, we give some more suggestions. Discovery Bible reading, conversational prayer, some key ideas that you can share as you encourage people to read the story of Jesus. And let this story of Jesus grow. Now with that background, you might go back to reading the book If You Can Eat. How many of you read this book? Let me see. Yes, some of you. Do some of you not have it? Because we do have more copies, and if you'd like some copies, we can give you one uh, today, right? But it might encourage you to go back and, and look at that um, and, and then find opportunities to share faith so that Melbourne City Church could perhaps be like a discussion centre for, um, for Roy and Gina, where they discuss with you on a regular basis and you go out to share faith where you are so that the whole city of Melbourne can hear the word of the Lord as a result of this being a mission hub. Now, of course, one reason for asking where do you live, where have you come from uh, in coming here today is that if you're going to reach the centre of the city, um, you're going to have to be very proactive. It's not going to happen through having a centre here on whatever level of this building we're at. Rather, it's going to take what some other Christians are doing, some other Christians who are not of Adventist heritage, they're actually connecting in offices around the city and they're connecting in home units in the high-rise buildings of the city. And they're using a similar process they're not calling it Discovery Bible Reading, but they're encouraging Bible reading groups in offices. So if there's a Christian in an office, can that Christian have morning tea, afternoon tea, lunch with some friends and get a little group together to read the Bible, the story of Jesus, once a day, twice a week. So you read the story and you share faith in that, in that group, in that office. Or you do it in a home unit. So that this starts multiplying throughout the city. I don't know whether you're in contact with some of these groups, but some of these groups are multiplying through the CBD of Melbourne to share the story of Jesus. But you can also do this in Narrawarren or in Preston or in Inner West or in Adelaide even, or wherever you come from, so that you can share the story of Jesus with people, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Keep it simple, keep it reproducible, Keep it at a level where it costs no money and you can multiply the story of Jesus with others. So take as many bookmarks as you'd like or this other brochure and feel free to be in touch through Roy and Gina with more questions as to how you might apply this to life. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you for the opportunity of sharing the morning together. I pray for the outpouring and the infilling of your Holy Spirit. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will baptize us afresh and anew so that we know your presence. We experience the joy and the peace that comes from having you live within us, bringing the presence of Jesus and the Father into our lives so that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And, and I pray for your presence, Holy Spirit, that you'll anoint each of us with uh, your presence each day to keep us awake and uh, open and alive uh, to the needs of our colleagues and friends so that we can see those opportunities to share the story of Jesus. So I pray that this will become, this center will become a center of multiplication, a center of multiplying disciples, multiplying churches throughout the CBD, and, uh, and across Victoria, and maybe back into some of our home places that we come from. We commit ourselves to you, our God. We thank you for the privilege and the joy of living for you as we go out into the city this week, in Jesus' name. Amen.